The Full Stories of Book of Genesis By Biblical Believers Creation of the World In the beginning, God crafted the heavens and the earth from the void of nothingness. With each passing day, He spoke creation into existence, starting with the separation of light from darkness. On the second day, God formed the expanse of the sky, dividing the waters above from the waters below. The third day saw the emergence of dry land and the birth of vegetation, plants bearing seed and fruit trees yielding fruit. God then set the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens to govern the day and night, marking the fourth day. On the fifth day, God filled the seas with living creatures and the skies with birds of every kind. The sixth day brought forth the animals of the land, each according to their kind. Finally, God formed man and woman in his own image, blessing them and granting them dominion over all the earth. With his work complete, God rested on the seventh day, sanctifying it as a day of rest. Creation of Adam and Eve In the Garden of Eden, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground, breathing the breath of life into his nostrils. Adam became a living being, placed in the garden to tend and keep it. Seeing that it was not good for Adam to be alone, God caused him to fall into a deep sleep. He took one of Adam's ribs and fashioned it into a woman, bringing her to Adam as his companion and helper. Adam named her Eve, for she would become the mother of all the living. Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony with each other and with God, enjoying the beauty and abundance of the garden. They had the freedom to eat from any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for God had warned them that doing so would bring death. In their innocence, Adam and Eve walked with God, experiencing the joy of His presence in the paradise He had created for them. The Fall of Man One day, as Eve wandered near the forbidden tree, the serpent approached her with a cunning question. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Eve explained that they could eat from all the trees except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for they would surely die. The serpent, with deceptive words, convinced Eve that she would not die but rather become like God, knowing good and evil. Enticed by the fruit's appeal and the promise of wisdom, Eve took a bite and shared it with Adam. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they realized their nakedness, sewing fig leaves together to cover themselves. When God called out to them, they hid in shame. Confronted by their disobedience, Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent. As a consequence of their sin, God pronounced judgments, pain in childbirth for Eve, toil and hardship for Adam, and enmity between the serpent and the woman's offspring. Banished from the garden and cut off from the tree of life, Adam and Eve faced a world marred by sin and death. Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve bore two sons, Cain, a tiller of the ground, and Abel, a keeper of sheep. In the course of time, both brothers brought offerings to God. Cain presented some of the fruits of the soil, while Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. God looked favorably upon Abel and his offering, but did not regard Cain and his offering. Cain, consumed by anger and jealousy, allowed sin to fester in his heart. God warned him that sin was crouching at the door, urging him to master it. One day, Cain invited Abel out to the field, and there he rose up against his brother and killed him. When God inquired about Abel's whereabouts, Cain responded with defiance, asking, Am I my brother's keeper? God, aware of Cain's heinous act, pronounced a curse upon him, banishing him from the ground that had received his brother's blood. Cain, fearing retribution, lamented that his punishment was too great to bear. God placed a mark on Cain to protect him from harm, sending him out as a fugitive and wanderer on the earth. The story of Cain and Abel serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of jealousy, anger, and sin, and the importance of mastering one's impulses and seeking God's guidance. Descendants of Adam From Adam and Eve, the human race began to multiply and spread across the earth. The generations that followed included notable figures such as Seth, born after the loss of Abel, and his son Enosh, during whose time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. As the years passed, the descendants of Adam continued to increase in number, with each generation living for several hundreds of years. The genealogy records the lives of Kenan, Mahalalel, and Jared, showcasing the longevity of the early patriarchs. Among them was Enoch, who walked faithfully with God and was taken by him without experiencing death. Enoch's son, Methuselah, holds the distinction of being the longest living individual mentioned in the Bible, reaching the age of 969 years. Methuselah's son, Lamech, became the father of Noah, 
whose birth brought hope and the promise of relief from the toil and hardship of a world affected by sin. The descendants of Adam serve as a testament to the resilience and growth of humanity, even in the face of the challenges and consequences of the fall. Their stories remind us of the importance of faith, obedience, and the pursuit of a relationship with God, as well as the impact of our choices on future generations. The Wickedness of the World As humanity multiplied and spread across the earth, so did wickedness and corruption. The hearts of men became filled with evil thoughts and desires, and violence and depravity spread like a plague. God, looking upon the earth, saw that every inclination of the human heart was continually bent towards evil. The wickedness of mankind grieved him deeply, and he regretted creating them. In his righteous judgment, God resolved to wipe humanity from the face of the earth, along with the animals, creatures, and birds of the sky. However, amidst the widespread corruption, one man found favor in God's eyes. Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries, and he walked faithfully with God. God revealed to Noah his plan to cleanse the earth of its wickedness through a great flood. He instructed Noah to build an ark, providing specific dimensions and materials for its construction. Noah was to gather his family, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, into the ark, along with representatives of every animal species, to ensure their survival during the impending judgment. Despite the mockery and disbelief of those around him, Noah obeyed God's commands, laboring tirelessly to build the ark and prepare for the catastrophe that would reshape the world and its inhabitants. Noah's Ark As the wickedness of humanity reached its tipping point, God spoke to Noah, revealing his plan to cleanse the earth of its corruption through a devastating flood. Noah found favor in God's eyes, standing as a righteous man amidst a generation consumed by evil. God instructed Noah to construct an ark, a massive vessel designed to preserve life during the impending deluge. The ark was to be built with gopher wood, measuring 300 cubits in length, 50 cubits in width, and 30 cubits in height. It would feature a roof, a door in its side, and three decks to accommodate Noah's family and the animals. God commanded Noah to gather his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, ensuring their safety within the ark. Additionally, Noah was tasked with bringing representatives of every animal kind, two of each, male and female, into the ark to preserve their species. Birds, livestock, and creatures that crawled on the ground were all to find refuge within the ark's walls. God instructed Noah to gather enough food for his family and the animals, ensuring their sustenance during their time aboard the vessel. Despite the enormity of the task and the ridicule of those around him, Noah demonstrated unwavering faith and obedience to God's commands. He labored tirelessly to construct the ark according to the divine specifications, undeterred by the disbelief and mockery of his contemporaries. As the final preparations were made and the ark stood ready, Noah and his family entered the vessel, placing their trust in God's protection and provision. The stage was set for a cataclysmic event that would reshape the world and mark a new beginning for humanity. The Great Flood As Noah and his family took refuge in the ark, the heavens opened and the fountains of the deep burst forth. Torrential rains descended upon the earth, unleashing a deluge that would last for 40 days and 40 nights. The waters rose steadily, submerging even the highest mountains under 15 cubits of water. Every living creature on the face of the earth perished. Birds, livestock, animals, and every swarming thing, along with all mankind. Only Noah and those with him in the ark remained alive, floating above the chaos and destruction. The floodwaters prevailed upon the earth for 150 days, cleansing it of its corruption and wickedness. As the rain subsided and the waters began to recede, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Noah sent out a raven and a dove to assess the earth's condition, waiting patiently for the land to dry. The dove returned with an olive leaf, indicating that the waters had subsided and eventually did not return at all. After over a year since the flood began, Noah, his family, and the animals emerged from the ark, setting foot on a world forever changed by God's judgment and mercy. The Great Flood serves as a powerful reminder of the consequences of sin and the importance of walking in righteousness before God. It also showcases God's power over creation, His justice in punishing wickedness, and His grace in preserving a remnant through Noah and his family. The Flood narrative demonstrates God's sovereignty and His ability to bring forth new beginnings and hope, even in the face of destruction and judgment. Covenant of the Rainbow 
As Noah and his family emerged from the ark, they built an altar and offered sacrifices to the Lord. God, pleased with their worship, made a covenant with Noah and all living creatures, promising never again to destroy the earth with a flood. As a sign of this everlasting covenant, God set a rainbow in the clouds, a beautiful reminder of his commitment to preserve life and his mercy toward his creation. Whenever the rainbow appears in the sky, God remembers his covenant with all flesh, and the waters will never again become a flood to destroy the earth. This covenant marks a new beginning for humanity, with God's blessing upon Noah and his descendants to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. It also establishes a new relationship between God and his creation, one based on his promise and faithfulness. The rainbow serves as a symbol of hope, a visual representation of God's love and grace, even in a world marred by sin. It reminds us that despite the challenges and trials we may face, God remains committed to his people and his creation. The covenant of the rainbow is a testament to God's sovereignty and his desire to sustain and redeem his world, offering hope and assurance to all who trust in him. Noah's Drunkenness After the flood, Noah, a man of the soil, began to cultivate the land and planted a vineyard. One day he drank of the wine and became intoxicated, lying uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan and one of Noah's sons, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. Shem and Japheth, in contrast, took a garment and walked backward into the tent, covering their father's nakedness without looking upon him. When Noah awoke from his drunken state and learned of Ham's actions, he pronounced a curse upon Canaan, Ham's son. Noah declared that Canaan would be the lowest of servants to his brothers. He also blessed Shem, stating that the Lord would be his God and that Canaan would be his servant. Noah then blessed Japheth, prophesying that he would dwell in the tents of Shem and that Canaan would be his servant as well. This incident serves as a reminder of the importance of honoring one's parents and the consequences of disrespectful behavior. It also highlights the significance of personal responsibility and the impact of one's actions on future generations. The curse upon Canaan and the blessings upon Shem and Japheth had far-reaching implications for their descendants and the nations that would arise from them. The story of Noah's drunkenness underscores the fallibility of even the most righteous individuals and the need for wisdom and self-control in all aspects of life. The Tower of Babel Years after the flood, as the descendants of Noah multiplied and spread across the earth, they found themselves in the land of Shinar. United by a common language and driven by pride, they decided to build a city with a tower that would reach into the heavens. Their goal was to make a name for themselves and to avoid being scattered over the face of the earth. However, God, seeing their arrogance and the potential for even greater rebellion, came down to observe their endeavors. Recognizing that with a unified language, nothing they proposed would be impossible for them, God resolved to confuse their speech and scatter them across the earth. He mixed up their language, causing them to speak in different tongues, making it impossible for them to understand one another. As a result, the construction of the city and the tower came to a halt, and the people were dispersed over the face of the earth, forming diverse nations and cultures. The place became known as Babel, which sounds like the Hebrew word for confused, because there, God confused the language of the whole world. The Tower of Babel serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of pride, self-exaltation, and the desire to operate independently of God. It demonstrates that human unity and achievement, when not aligned with God's purposes, can lead to confusion and dispersion. The story also highlights God's sovereignty over human affairs and his ability to thwart the plans of those who seek to elevate themselves above him. Call of Abram In the city of Ur, a man named Abram lived with his wife Sarai and his father Terah. God spoke to Abram, calling him to leave his country, his kindred, and his father's house, and to go to a land that he would show him. God made a profound promise to Abram, declaring that he would make him a great nation, bless him, and make his name great. Moreover, God pledged to bless those who blessed Abram and to curse those who dishonored him, and that through Abram, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Abram, demonstrating remarkable faith and obedience, heeded God's call and set out for the unknown land, taking his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all their possessions with them. They journeyed to the land of Canaan, where God appeared to Abram and affirmed that he would give this land to his offspring. Abram built an altar to the Lord at Shechem, near the Oak of Morah, and worshipped him. 
As Abram continued his journey, he built another altar between Bethel and Ai, calling upon the name of the Lord. Abram's unwavering trust in God's direction and promises set the stage for a remarkable journey of faith that would shape the course of history. His willingness to leave behind the familiar and step into the unknown solely based on God's word serves as an enduring example of the power of faith and the blessings that flow from obedience to God's call. Abram and Lot separate. As Abram and his nephew Lot journeyed together, their possessions and herds grew so abundant that the land could not support both of them living together. Strife arose between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot as the Canaanites and Perizzites also inhabited the land. Abram, seeking to maintain peace and unity, approached Lot with a proposal. He suggested that they separate and choose different areas to settle, offering Lot the first choice of the land. Lot, surveying the region, noticed the lush and well-watered Jordan Valley, which seemed like the Garden of the Lord similar to the land of Egypt. Attracted by its fertility and beauty, Lot chose to settle in the cities of the plain, pitching his tent near Sodom, a city known for its wickedness. Abram, on the other hand, remained in the land of Canaan. After their separation, the Lord spoke to Abram, reaffirming his promise to give him and his descendants all the land he could see, from north to south and east to west. God declared that he would make Abram's offspring as numerous as the dust of the earth, and encouraged him to walk the length and breadth of the land, for it would belong to him. Abram moved his tent and settled by the oaks of Mamre in Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. The separation of Abram and Lot highlights the importance of seeking peace and making wise choices. It also demonstrates God's faithfulness in fulfilling his promises to Abram, even in the midst of challenges and changes. Abram rescues Lot. During the time when Amraphel king of Shinar, Ariok king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goyim waged war against the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, who was living in Sodom, became caught in the middle of the conflict. The four kings defeated the five kings of the plain, seizing their possessions and capturing Lot and his goods. When Abram heard the news of his nephew's capture, he immediately gathered 318 of his trained men and set out in pursuit of the invading kings. Dividing his forces, Abram launched a surprise attack by night, defeating the enemy and pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Victorious, Abram brought back all the possessions, along with Lot and the people who had been taken captive. As Abram returned from the battle, he was met by Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of God Most High. Melchizedek blessed Abram, acknowledging his triumph and the God who had delivered his enemies into his hand. In response, Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the spoils, demonstrating his gratitude and reverence for the God he served. The king of Sodom also came to meet Abram, offering him the goods he had recovered, but Abram refused, declaring that he would not take anything belonging to the king, lest he claim to have made Abram rich. Abram's rescue of Lot showcases his bravery, loyalty, and faith in God. It also highlights the importance of standing up for one's family and the rewards of living a life dedicated to serving and honoring God. God's Covenant with Abram After Abram's victory over the kings, the Lord appeared to him in a vision, reassuring him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Abram, still childless, expressed his concern that his servant Eliezer of Damascus would be his heir. But God promised Abram that his own son would be his heir, and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Abram believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. God then reminded Abram that he had brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give him the land of Canaan as a possession. Abram asked for a sign to confirm this promise, and God instructed him to prepare a covenant ceremony. Abram brought a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, dividing them in half and arranging the halves opposite each other. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and God revealed to him the future of his descendants. He foretold their oppression in a foreign land for 400 years, but assured Abram that they would come out with great possessions and return to the land of Canaan. As darkness fell, a smoking oven and a burning torch passed between the divided animals, symbolizing God's presence and the sealing of the covenant. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, promising to give his descendants the land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. This covenant marked a pivotal moment in Abram's life and the history of God's people, establishing an everlasting promise and a special relationship between God and Abram's descendants. 
Hagar and Ishmael. As years passed and Sarai remained barren, she grew impatient waiting for God's promise of a child to be fulfilled. Taking matters into her own hands, Sarai gave her Egyptian maidservant Hagar to Abram as a wife, hoping to build a family through her. Abram agreed, and Hagar conceived a child. However, when Hagar realized she was pregnant, she began to despise Sarai. In response, Sarai treated Hagar harshly, causing her to flee into the wilderness. There, by a spring of water, the angel of the Lord found Hagar and asked her where she had come from and where she was going. Hagar explained her situation, and the angel instructed her to return to Sarai and submit to her authority. He also delivered a message from God, promising to multiply Hagar's descendants exceedingly so that they could not be counted. The angel told Hagar that she would give birth to a son and should name him Ishmael, meaning God hears, because the Lord had heard her affliction. Hagar, in awe of her encounter with God, called him, You are the God who sees, acknowledging his presence and care in her distress. She returned to Abram and Sarai and gave birth to a son, whom Abram named Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. The story of Hagar and Ishmael highlights the consequences of taking matters into one's own hands rather than trusting in God's timing and plan. It also demonstrates God's compassion and concern for the oppressed and marginalized as he heard Hagar's cry and provided for her in the wilderness. God's Covenant with Abraham When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him declaring, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. God reaffirmed his covenant with Abram, promising to make him the father of many nations. As a sign of this covenant, God changed Abram's name to Abraham, meaning father of a multitude. God also changed Sarai's name to Sarah, promising that she would become the mother of nations and that kings would descend from her. God established circumcision as a physical sign of the covenant, commanding Abraham and his male descendants to be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. This act would serve as a reminder of the everlasting covenant between God and Abraham's descendants. God further promised to give Abraham and his offspring the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession and to be their God. Abraham, demonstrating his faith and obedience, circumcised himself and all the males in his household that very day, just as God had commanded. This covenant marked a significant milestone in Abraham's journey of faith, as God reaffirmed his promises and established a lasting relationship with Abraham and his descendants. The sign of circumcision served as a physical reminder of the commitment to walk before God and live according to his ways. The Three Visitors One day, as Abraham sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing nearby. With eager hospitality, Abraham ran to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. He invited the visitors to rest under a tree while he brought water to wash their feet and bread to refresh their hearts. Abraham hurried to Sarah and asked her to quickly prepare cakes from fine meal. He then ran to the herd, selected a tender calf and gave it to a servant to prepare. Abraham served the visitors curds, milk and the cooked calf and stood by them under the tree as they ate. The men inquired about Sarah and one of them, who was the Lord, declared that Sarah would bear a son within a year. Sarah, who was listening at the tent door, laughed to herself, considering her old age and the improbability of having a child. The Lord questioned Abraham about Sarah's laughter, affirming that nothing was too hard for him and reiterating his promise. Sarah, out of fear, denied laughing, but the Lord gently corrected her. As the men rose to leave, Abraham walked with them to send them on their way. The Lord, recognizing Abraham's righteous character, resolved to reveal to him the impending judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham, concerned for the fate of the righteous in those cities, pleaded with the Lord to spare them if even a few righteous people could be found. The Lord agreed to spare the cities if ten righteous individuals were present. This encounter highlights Abraham's hospitality, faith, and intercession on behalf of others. It also showcases God's willingness to engage in dialogue with his faithful servants and his mercy in response to their prayers. Destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah As evening fell, two angels arrived at Sodom, where Abraham's nephew Lot sat at the city gate. Lot, recognizing the visitors, bowed before them and insisted that they stay at his house for the night. The angels initially declined, intending to spend the night in the city square, but Lot persisted, and they agreed to lodge with him. Lot prepared a feast for the guests, baking unleavened bread for them to eat. However, before they retired for the night, the men of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded Lot's house, demanding to have relations with the visitors. Lot, 
seeking to protect his guests, went outside and pleaded with the mob not to act wickedly. He even offered his two daughters to the men, but they refused, pressing hard against Lot and attempting to break down the door. The angels intervened, pulling Lot back inside and striking the men with blindness, rendering them unable to find the door. The angels then revealed to Lot that they had come to destroy the city due to its grievous sin. They urged Lot to gather his family and flee, but his sons-in-law thought he was joking and did not heed the warning. As dawn approached, the angels insisted that Lot, his wife, and his two daughters escape, taking them by the hand and leading them out of the city. The angels instructed them to flee to the mountains and not look back, lest they be swept away in the destruction. Lot, fearful of the mountains, requested to flee to a small nearby city, and the angels granted his plea. As Lot and his family fled, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, overthrowing the cities and all their inhabitants. Lot's wife, disobeying the command not to look back, turned into a pillar of salt. Abraham, rising early in the morning, looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and saw the dense smoke rising from the land, like the smoke of a furnace. God remembered Abraham and his intercession, sparing Lot from the catastrophe that destroyed the cities. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah serves as a sobering reminder of the consequences of unchecked wickedness and the importance of heeding God's warnings. It also highlights God's mercy in sparing the righteous and the power of intercessory prayer. Birth of Isaac As God had promised, Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. Abraham named the child Isaac, which means laughter, as God had brought joy and laughter to the elderly couple. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born, and Sarah marveled at God's faithfulness, exclaiming, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Abraham circumcised Isaac on the eighth day, as God had commanded, symbolizing the covenant between God and Abraham's descendants. The birth of Isaac marked the fulfillment of God's long-awaited promise to Abraham and Sarah, demonstrating his power to accomplish the impossible and his faithfulness to his word. As Isaac grew, the child became a source of great joy and laughter for the family, a tangible reminder of God's grace and provision. However, the arrival of Isaac also brought new challenges, as tensions arose between Sarah and Hagar, Abraham's other wife and the mother of Ishmael. Sarah, protective of Isaac's position as the child of promise, demanded that Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael away. Although distressed by this request, Abraham, guided by God's direction, provided for Hagar and Ishmael and sent them into the wilderness, trusting in God's plan for their future. The birth of Isaac stands as a pivotal moment in the history of God's people, marking the beginning of the fulfillment of the covenant promises made to Abraham. It showcases God's sovereignty, faithfulness, and ability to bring forth life and joy even in the most unlikely circumstances. Expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael As Isaac grew and was weaned, Abraham held a great feast to celebrate the occasion. During the festivities, Sarah observed Ishmael, the son of Hagar the Egyptian, mocking and playing with Isaac. Concerned for her son's future and the inheritance promised to him, Sarah confronted Abraham, demanding that he cast out Hagar and Ishmael. She insisted that Ishmael would not be an heir alongside Isaac. Abraham was deeply distressed by this request, as Ishmael was also his son and he cared for him greatly. However, God spoke to Abraham, reassuring him and instructing him to listen to Sarah's words. God promised to make Ishmael into a great nation as well, for he was Abraham's offspring. Comforted by God's guidance, Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, and gave them to Hagar. He sent her away with Ishmael, and they wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water ran out, Hagar placed Ishmael under a shrub and sat down a bowshot away, weeping and unable to watch her child die of thirst. God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, reassuring her and promising to make Ishmael into a great nation. God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went, filled the skin with water, and gave the boy a drink. God was with Ishmael as he grew up in the wilderness, and he became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael highlights the complex dynamics within Abraham's family, and the challenges that arose from the interplay of human choices and divine promises. It also demonstrates God's concern for the marginalized and his faithfulness to provide for and bless Ishmael, even though he was not the child of the covenant promise.
The story serves as a reminder that God's plans are not always aligned with human expectations and that he works in mysterious ways to accomplish his purposes. Binding of Isaac. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, calling out to him, Abraham! Abraham responded, Here I am. God instructed Abraham to take his son, his only son Isaac, whom he loved, to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. Abraham, demonstrating unwavering faith and obedience, rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men and Isaac with him. He split the wood for the burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. He instructed the young men to stay with the donkey while he and Isaac went to worship, expressing his belief that they would both return. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, while he carried the fire and the knife. As they walked together, Isaac asked his father about the lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham replied, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. When they reached the place God had designated, Abraham built an altar, arranged the wood, bound Isaac, and laid him on the altar. As Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, stopping him and acknowledging his fear of God, as he had not withheld his only son. Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. He took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named the place, The Lord Will Provide, and it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time, reaffirming the covenant blessings and promises, stating that because Abraham had not withheld his son, his only son, God would surely bless him and multiply his descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand on the seashore. The binding of Isaac stands as a profound testament to Abraham's faith and obedience, showcasing his willingness to sacrifice even his beloved son in response to God's command. It also foreshadows God's own sacrificial love in providing his son, Jesus Christ, as the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of humanity. The story highlights the importance of trusting God, even in the face of seemingly impossible circumstances, and the blessings that flow from such unwavering faith. Death and Burial of Sarah At the age of 127 years, Sarah, Abraham's beloved wife, passed away in Kirjath Arba, also known as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her, expressing his deep grief and love for his lifelong companion. After a time of mourning, Abraham rose and spoke to the sons of Heth, the Hittites who inhabited the land. He requested a burial property, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The sons of Heth responded with respect and honor, acknowledging Abraham as a mighty prince among them and offering him the choicest of their burial places. Abraham, however, had a specific place in mind. He bowed before the people of the land and asked them to approach Ephron, the son of Zohar, on his behalf, requesting the cave of Machpelah at the end of Ephron's field. Abraham offered to pay the full price for the field and the cave, ensuring a permanent burial place for his family. Ephron, who was sitting among the sons of Heth, responded graciously, offering to give the field and the cave to Abraham in the presence of his people. Abraham, insisting on paying for the property, weighed out the silver Ephron had named, 400 shekels of silver, according to the currency of the merchants. With the transaction completed, the field of Ephron and the cave of Machpelah were deeded to Abraham as a burial property. Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The death and burial of Sarah marked a significant moment in Abraham's life, as he mourned the loss of his beloved partner and secured a permanent resting place for his family in the land God had promised him. The cave of Machpelah would become the burial site for several generations of patriarchs and matriarchs, serving as a tangible connection to the land and a reminder of God's faithfulness. Isaac and Rebekah As Abraham advanced in age, he called his oldest servant, who ruled over all that he had, and made him swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that he would not take a wife for Isaac from the daughters of the Canaanites. Instead, Abraham instructed the servant to go to his country and his family to find a wife for his son. The servant, seeking divine guidance, prayed to the Lord and set out on his mission with ten camels loaded with his master's goods. 
Arriving at the city of Nahor, the servant made the camels kneel down by a well of water outside the city in the evening, when women go out to draw water. He prayed for success, asking for a sign, that the young woman who offered to give him a drink and also draw water for his camels would be the one appointed by God for Isaac. Before he had finished speaking, Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. She was a beautiful young woman, and the servant ran to meet her, asking for a drink from her pitcher. Rebekah quickly lowered her pitcher, gave him a drink, and offered to draw water for his camels until they had finished drinking. The servant watched her, wondering if the Lord had made his journey prosperous. After the camels had finished drinking, the servant gave Rebekah a golden nose ring and two golden bracelets, inquiring about her family and lodging. Rebekah identified herself as the daughter of Bethuel, and assured him that there was plenty of straw, feed, and room to lodge at her home. The servant, overjoyed, bowed down and worshipped the Lord, acknowledging his faithfulness in leading him to the house of his master's brethren. Rebekah ran and told her household about the encounter, and her brother Laban welcomed the servant and his camels into their home. The servant recounted the purpose of his journey and the events at the well, emphasizing God's guidance and blessing. Laban and Bethuel, recognizing the Lord's hand in the matter, agreed to let Rebekah go and become Isaac's wife. The servant, eager to return to his master, departed with Rebekah and her nurse the next morning, with the blessings of her family. As they approached Canaan, Isaac, who had gone out to meditate in the field in the evening, saw the camels coming. Rebekah, seeing Isaac, dismounted from her camel and asked the servant about him. The servant explained that it was his master, Isaac. Rebekah took a veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that had happened. Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent, and she became his wife. Isaac loved her, and he was comforted after his mother's death. The story of Isaac and Rebekah demonstrates God's providence in guiding the servant to find the right wife for Isaac, ensuring the continuity of the covenant promises. It also highlights the importance of seeking God's guidance in matters of marriage and trusting in his perfect timing and provision. Esau sells his birthright. Isaac and Rebekah's twin sons, Esau and Jacob, grew up with distinct personalities and preferences. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. One day, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, weary and famished. Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Jacob, seizing the opportunity, replied, Sell me your birthright as of this day. Esau, driven by his hunger and impulsiveness, declared, Look, I am about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Jacob insisted that Esau swear to him, and Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, confirming the transaction with an oath. Jacob then gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, which he ate and drank before rising and going his way. The scripture emphasizes that Esau despised his birthright, treating it as a trivial matter in comparison to his immediate desires. The birthright in ancient Near Eastern culture encompassed not only a double portion of the inheritance, but also spiritual blessings and responsibilities. By selling his birthright for a mere bowl of stew, Esau demonstrated a lack of regard for the long-term significance of his position as the firstborn son. This incident sets the stage for future conflicts between the brothers and highlights the divergent paths they would take. It also serves as a cautionary tale about the consequences of valuing temporary gratification over lasting spiritual blessings and the importance of making wise choices in light of eternity. Isaac's Blessing as Isaac grew old and his eyes became so dim that he could not see, he called for his older son Esau. Believing that his death was near, Isaac instructed Esau to take his weapons, go out to the field, and hunt game for him. He asked Esau to prepare a savory meal, such as he loved, so that he could eat it and bless him before his death. Rebekah, overhearing the conversation, devised a plan to secure the blessing for her favored son, Jacob. She instructed Jacob to bring two choice kids from the flock, which she would prepare as a savory dish for Isaac. Rebekah then took Esau's best garments and put them on Jacob, and she covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the skins of the kids. Jacob brought the meal to his father, pretending to be Esau and claiming to have done as he was asked. Isaac, surprised by the quick return, questioned whether it was truly Esau. Jacob deceived his father, asserting that the Lord had brought him success in the hunt. Isaac, still uncertain, asked Jacob to come near so he could feel him, to determine whether he was indeed Esau. 
Feeling the hairy skin on Jacob's hands and neck, Isaac declared, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He asked once more if it was truly Esau, and Jacob confirmed the deception. Isaac then ate the meal and asked Jacob to come near and kiss him. As Jacob approached, Isaac smelled the scent of his garments and blessed him, invoking the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. He also declared that peoples would serve him, nations would bow down to him, and he would be master over his brothers. Shortly after Jacob left his father's presence, Esau returned from his hunting, prepared a savory meal, and brought it to Isaac. Confused, Isaac trembled exceedingly and realized that he had been deceived. Esau cried out with a great and bitter cry, pleading for a blessing as well. Isaac, however, could not revoke the blessing given to Jacob, stating that he had made him master over Esau and sustained him with grain and wine. Esau, distressed, asked if there was only one blessing and if Isaac had not reserved a blessing for him. Isaac, moved by Esau's plea, declared that his dwelling would be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven above. He also foretold that Esau would live by the sword and serve his brother, but when he became restless, he would break Jacob's yoke from his neck. Esau, angry and resentful, determined in his heart to kill Jacob after their father's death. When Rebekah learned of Esau's intentions, she advised Jacob to flee to her brother Laban in Haran until Esau's fury subsided. The deception surrounding Isaac's blessing had far-reaching consequences, fueling the rivalry between Jacob and Esau and setting in motion a series of events that would shape the destiny of their descendants. It also highlights the importance of integrity, the power of words spoken in blessing or cursing, and the sovereignty of God in fulfilling His purposes despite human schemes and shortcomings. Jacob's Ladder As Jacob journeyed from Beersheba to Haran, he came to a certain place and rested for the night, using a stone as his pillow. In his dream, Jacob saw a ladder set up on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven. Angels of God were ascending and descending on it, and the Lord stood above it, reaffirming the covenant promises made to Abraham and Isaac. God assured Jacob that the land on which he lay would be given to him and his descendants, who would be as numerous as the dust of the earth. The Lord also promised to be with Jacob wherever he went and to bring him back to the land, not leaving him until all that had been spoken was accomplished. Jacob awoke from his sleep filled with awe and declared, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. He took the stone he had used as a pillow, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it, naming the place Bethel, which means house of God. Jacob then made a vow, stating that if God would be with him, keep him safe, provide for his needs, and bring him back to his father's house in peace, then the Lord would be his God, and he would give a tenth of all that God gave him. The dream of Jacob's ladder symbolizes the connection between heaven and earth, with God's presence and providence extending to his chosen people. It also foreshadows the coming of Jesus Christ, who would bridge the gap between God and humanity, providing access to the Father through faith in him. Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. When Jacob arrived in Haran, he met Rachel, the daughter of his uncle Laban, tending her father's sheep. Jacob fell in love with Rachel and agreed to serve Laban for seven years in order to marry her. The years seemed like only a few days to Jacob because of his love for Rachel. After the seven years, Jacob asked Laban to give him his wife, but Laban deceived him by giving him Leah, Rachel's older sister, on the wedding night. In the morning, Jacob realized the deception and confronted Laban. Laban explained that it was not customary to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn and offered Rachel to Jacob in exchange for another seven years of service. Jacob agreed and completed the bridal week with Leah before marrying Rachel. He loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. The Lord, seeing that Leah was unloved, opened her womb, and she bore four sons to Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Meanwhile, Rachel remained barren, which caused tension and jealousy between the sisters. The story of Jacob's marriages to Leah and Rachel highlights the complicated family dynamics and the challenges that arise from polygamy and favoritism. It also demonstrates God's sovereignty in fulfilling His purposes despite human failings and the importance of trusting in His timing and provision. Jacob's Children and Wealth Increase As Jacob continued to serve Laban, his family and wealth grew. Leah bore four more sons, Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah, a daughter. Rachel, still barren, gave her maidservant Bilhah to Jacob as a wife, and Bilhah bore two sons, Dan and Naphtali. Leah, following suit, gave her maidservant Zilpah to Jacob, and she bore two sons, Gad and Asher. 
Later God remembered Rachel and opened her womb, and she gave birth to a son, Joseph. With the birth of Joseph, Jacob desired to return to his own land and asked Laban to send him away with his wives and children. Laban, recognizing that the Lord had blessed him because of Jacob, persuaded him to stay, offering to pay him wages. Jacob proposed a plan to build his own flocks by keeping the speckled, spotted, and brown sheep and goats, while Laban would keep the rest. Laban agreed, but he removed all the marked animals from the flocks and put them under the care of his sons, separating them from Jacob's flocks. Jacob, using various methods with the strong animals, caused them to bear striped, speckled, and spotted offspring, increasing his own flocks while Laban's remained solid-colored. As a result, Jacob's wealth grew exceedingly, and he acquired many flocks, male and female servants, camels, and donkeys. The increase of Jacob's children and wealth demonstrates God's faithfulness in fulfilling his promises and blessing Jacob, even in the midst of challenging family dynamics and unfair treatment by Laban. It also sets the stage for the eventual return of Jacob to his homeland and the continuation of the covenant promise through his offspring. Jacob flees from Laban. After Jacob had lived with Laban for 20 years, he noticed a change in Laban's attitude towards him. Laban's sons also complained that Jacob had taken away their father's wealth. God spoke to Jacob, instructing him to return to the land of his fathers, assuring him of his presence and protection. Jacob called for Rachel and Leah, explaining the situation and his desire to leave. He recounted how Laban had changed his wages ten times, but God had not allowed him to harm Jacob. The sisters agreed, acknowledging that their father had treated them as foreigners and had consumed their money. They encouraged Jacob to do whatever God had told him. Jacob set his wives and children on camels and left with all his livestock and possessions, heading for the land of Canaan. Rachel, without Jacob's knowledge, stole her father's household idols. Three days after Jacob's departure, Laban learned of it and pursued him for seven days, finally overtaking him in the mountains of Gilead. God warned Laban in a dream not to speak to Jacob either good or bad. When Laban confronted Jacob, he complained about the secret departure and not being able to kiss his daughters and grandchildren goodbye. He also accused Jacob of stealing his gods. Jacob, unaware of Rachel's theft, declared that whoever had stolen the idols should not live. Laban searched the tents but did not find the idols, as Rachel had hidden them in her camel's saddle and sat on them. Jacob, angry with Laban, rebuked him for his harsh treatment and changed wages. Laban proposed a covenant between them, and they made a heap of stones as a witness. They agreed not to pass beyond the heap to harm each other and called upon God to watch between them when they were apart. After eating a meal together, Laban rose early, kissed his daughters and grandchildren, and blessed them before returning home. The story of Jacob fleeing from Laban highlights the tensions and conflicts that can arise in family relationships, especially when deceit and self-interest are involved. It also demonstrates God's protection and guidance in Jacob's life, even when he faced opposition and uncertainty. The covenant made between Jacob and Laban serves as a reminder of the importance of setting boundaries and seeking peace in relationships. Jacob wrestles with God. As Jacob continued his journey back to Canaan, he sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau, seeking favor and informing him of his return. The messengers returned, reporting that Esau was coming to meet Jacob with 400 men. Jacob, greatly afraid and distressed, divided his people and possessions into two camps, reasoning that if Esau attacked one camp, the other might escape. He then prayed to God, acknowledging his faithfulness and requesting deliverance from Esau, fearing that he might attack and destroy the mothers with the children. Jacob prepared a generous gift of livestock to appease Esau and sent it ahead in separate droves. That night, Jacob sent his wives, children, and possessions across the ford of the Jabbok while he remained alone on the other side. As he was alone, a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, causing it to be out of joint. The man said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked Jacob his name, and when Jacob told him, the man said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob asked for the man's name, but he replied, Why is it that you ask about my name? And blessed him there. Jacob named the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. As the sun rose, Jacob limped because of his hip, and the children of Israel to this day do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, 
because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. The wrestling match between Jacob and the divine being represents a pivotal moment in Jacob's life, where he confronts his past, his fears, and his relationship with God. The change of his name to Israel signifies a transformation in his character and destiny as he becomes the father of the twelve tribes that will bear his name. The story also highlights the persistence and determination of Jacob in seeking God's blessing and the intimate, personal nature of his encounter with the divine. Jacob and Esau Reconcile After his wrestling encounter, Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with four hundred men. He divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants, putting the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. Jacob himself went on ahead, bowing to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau inquired about the women and children, Jacob introduced them, and they bowed before Esau. Esau then asked about the droves of livestock he had encountered, and Jacob explained that they were a gift to find favor in Esau's sight. Esau initially refused the gift, saying he had enough, but Jacob insisted, and Esau accepted it. Esau proposed that they journey together, but Jacob, concerned about the pace of his flocks and young children, suggested that Esau go ahead while he followed at a slower pace. Esau offered to leave some of his men with Jacob, but Jacob declined, saying it was unnecessary. Esau returned to Seir while Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built a house and made booths for his livestock. Later, Jacob arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped before the city. He bought the plot of land where he pitched his tent and erected an altar there, calling it El Elohe Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. The reconciliation between Jacob and Esau demonstrates the power of forgiveness, the importance of humility, and the resolution of long-standing conflicts. Despite Jacob's past deception and the potential for hostility, Esau's warm reception and Jacob's gestures of respect and generosity pave the way for a peaceful reunion. The story also highlights the fulfillment of God's promise to protect and bless Jacob, even as he returns to the land of his fathers. The Dinah Incident After Jacob and his family settled near the city of Shechem, Jacob's daughter Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land. Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the country, saw her, took her, and lay with her, violating her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to her. Shechem asked his father Hamor to get Dinah for him as a wife. When Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter, his sons were in the field with the livestock, so he held his peace until they came home. Hamor went out to speak with Jacob, proposing that their peoples intermarry and live together, offering them the land to dwell in and trade. Shechem also offered to give whatever dowry and gift they asked, urging them to give him Dinah as a wife. Jacob's sons answered Shechem and Hamor deceitfully, because Shechem had defiled their sister. They said they could not give their sister to an uncircumcised man, but if every male among the Hivites would be circumcised, then they would consent to the marriage and live among them as one people. Hamer and Shechem agreed to the proposal and convinced the men of the city to be circumcised, highlighting the benefits of an alliance with Jacob's wealthy family. On the third day, when the men of Shechem were in pain from the circumcision, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords, boldly attacked the unsuspecting city, and killed all the males, including Hamer and Shechem. They took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob then plundered the city, taking their livestock, wealth, and wives and children captive. Jacob rebuked Simeon and Levi, saying they had troubled him by making him obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, exposing him to danger from the Canaanites and Perizzites. Simeon and Levi defended their actions, asking if they should have allowed their sister to be treated like a harlot. The story of Dinah's violation and the subsequent revenge by her brothers highlights the complex issues of honor, justice, and the consequences of sexual violence in ancient times. It also demonstrates the dangers of deceit and the escalation of violence, even in the pursuit of retribution. The incident has far-reaching effects on Jacob's relationship with the inhabitants of the land and underscores the importance of wisdom and restraint in dealing with the conflicts. God blesses Jacob at Bethel. After the incident at Shechem, God instructed Jacob to go to Bethel, settle there, and build an altar to the God who appeared to him when he fled from his brother Esau. Jacob gathered his household and told them to put away the foreign gods among them, purify themselves, and change their garments. 
He planned to build an altar to God, who had answered him in the day of his distress and had been with him wherever he went. They gave Jacob all their foreign gods and the earrings in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree near Shechem. As they journeyed, the terror of God was upon the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. Jacob and his company came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There, he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because God had revealed himself to him there when he fled from his brother. Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree, which was named Alan Bachuth, meaning Oak of Weeping. God appeared to Jacob again and blessed him, reaffirming that his name would no longer be Jacob, but Israel. God identified himself as God Almighty and commanded Jacob to be fruitful and multiply, promising that a nation and a company of nations would come from him and kings would come from his body. God also reiterated his promise to give Jacob and his descendants the land he had given to Abraham and Isaac. After God finished speaking with him, Jacob set up a pillar of stone and poured a drink offering and oil on it, calling the place Bethel. As they journeyed from Bethel, Rachel went into labor and gave birth to a son, but she had hard labor. As she was dying, she named the child Ben-Oni, meaning son of my sorrow. But Jacob called him Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand. Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem, and Jacob set a pillar on her grave. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. While Israel dwelt in that land, Reuben lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. The chapter concludes by listing the twelve sons of Jacob and mentioning the death and burial of Isaac, with his sons Esau and Jacob burying him. Jacob's return to Bethel marks a significant moment of spiritual renewal and recommitment to God. The putting away of foreign gods and the building of the altar demonstrate Jacob's desire to leave behind the past and embrace a future centered on his relationship with the Lord. God's reaffirmation of the covenant promises and the change of Jacob's name to Israel solidify his identity and destiny as the father of the twelve tribes. The chapter also records the deaths of Deborah, Rachel, and Isaac, signifying the passing of one generation and the continuation of the covenant through the next. Esau's Descendants The chapter begins by identifying Esau as Edom and listing his wives, Ada the daughter of Elon the Hittite, Aholabama the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. It then records the sons born to Esau in the land of Canaan, Eliphaz, born to Ada, Royal, born to Basemath, and Jush, Jalam, and Korah, born to Aholabama. Esau took his wives, sons, daughters, and all the persons of his household, his livestock, and all his possessions which he had gained in Canaan, and moved to a land away from his brother Jacob. The brothers had too many possessions to dwell together, and the land where they were staying could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. The text then provides a detailed genealogy of Esau's descendants, starting with his sons and their children. It lists the chiefs of the Edomites according to their settlements in the land of their possession. The chapter also mentions that Esau took possession of Mount Seir, driving out the Horites who previously inhabited the land. It records the descendants of Seir the Horite, who inhabited the land before Esau, and the kings who reigned in Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. The chapter concludes by listing the chiefs of Esau according to their families, places, and names emphasizing that these were the chiefs of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession, and that Esau was the father of the Edomites. The record of Esau's descendants and their establishment in Edom provides important historical and geographical context for the development of the Israelite nation. It also demonstrates the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, as both Isaac and Ishmael's descendants are chronicled. The chapter highlights the separation between Esau and Jacob as Esau moves away to Seir, allowing Jacob to settle in the land of Canaan, where the covenant promise will continue through his lineage. Joseph sold by his brothers. The narrative shifts focus to Jacob's son Joseph, who, at 17 years old, was tending the flock with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Joseph brought a bad report about his brothers to their father. Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of them, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Joseph had a dream and told it to his brothers, which made them hate him even more. 
In the dream, he and his brothers were binding sheaves in the field, and his sheaf arose and stood upright, while his brother's sheaves stood around and bowed down to his sheaf. His brothers reacted angrily, asking if he intended to reign over them. Joseph then had another dream, in which the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed down to him. He told this dream to his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him, asking if he, Joseph's mother, and his brothers would bow down to him. His brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. When Joseph's brothers went to feed their father's flock near Shechem, Israel sent Joseph to check on them. Joseph found his brothers in Dothan, but when they saw him afar off, they conspired against him to kill him, planning to throw him into a pit and say that a wild beast had devoured him. Reuben, hearing the plan, suggested they not kill him, but instead cast him into a pit, intending to rescue him later and return him to their father. When Joseph arrived, his brothers stripped him of his coat of many colors, cast him into a pit, and sat down to eat a meal. When a company of Ishmaelite traders passed by, Judah convinced his brothers to sell Joseph to them instead of killing him, as he was their brother and their flesh. The brothers sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took him to Egypt. Reuben, who was not present for the sale, returned to the pit and, finding Joseph gone, tore his clothes in grief. The brothers then took Joseph's coat, dipped it in the blood of a kid of the goats, and brought it to their father, saying they had found it and asking him to identify it as Joseph's. Jacob recognized the coat and concluded that a wild beast had devoured his son. He tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, saying he would go down into the grave mourning for his son. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. The story of Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers is a pivotal moment in the narrative of Genesis. It sets in motion a chain of events that will eventually lead to the migration of Jacob's family to Egypt and the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that his descendants would be sojourners in a land that was not theirs. The story also highlights the dangers of jealousy and the consequences of betrayal within a family. Despite the brothers' cruel actions, God's sovereign plan continues to unfold, as Joseph's presence in Egypt will ultimately provide a means of salvation for his family and the surrounding nations during a severe famine. Judah and Tamar The narrative takes a detour to focus on the story of Judah, one of Joseph's brothers. Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adullamite named Hira. There he saw and married the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. She conceived and bore a son, and Judah named him Er. She conceived again and bore a son, naming him Onan. She bore another son and named him Shelah. Judah was in Chazib when she bore him. Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Judah then instructed Onan to marry Tamar and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, to raise up an heir for his brother. However, Onan knew that the heir would not be his, so whenever he went in to his brother's wife, he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. This displeased the Lord, and he put Onan to death also. Judah, fearing that Shelah might die like his brothers, told Tamar to remain a widow in her father's house until Shelah grew up. Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had finished mourning, he went up to his sheep shearers in Timnah with his friend Hira the Adullamite. Tamar was told that her father-in-law was going to Timnah to shear his sheep. She took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself, and sat in an open place on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, but she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. He turned to her and propositioned her, not knowing she was his daughter-in-law. Tamar asked what he would give her, and Judah offered a young goat from the flock. She requested a pledge until he sent it, and he gave her his signet, cord, and staff. Judah went into her, and she conceived by him. She arose, went away, took off her veil, and put on her widow's garments. Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he could not find her. When he asked the men of that place about the harlot, they said there was no harlot in that place. Judah decided to let her keep the pledge, lest he be shamed. About three months later, Judah was told that Tamar had played the harlot and was with child. Judah ordered her to be brought out and burned. But when she was brought out, she sent the signet, cord, and staff to Judah, saying she was with child by the man to whom these belonged. 
Judah acknowledged them and said she had been more righteous than he, because he had not given her to Sheila his son. Tamar bore twins, and during the delivery one put out his hand, and the midwife tied a scarlet thread on it, saying he came out first. But he drew back his hand, and his brother came out, and she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother with the scarlet thread came out, and his name was called Zerah. The story of Judah and Tamar highlights the complexities of family relationships, the importance of fulfilling one's obligations, and the consequences of deception. It also demonstrates that even the patriarchs and their families were not immune to sin and its effects. Despite the questionable actions of both Judah and Tamar, God works through their circumstances to maintain the lineage of Judah, which will eventually lead to the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Joseph and Potiphar's Wife The narrative returns to Joseph, who had been brought down to Egypt and sold to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, finding favor in the sight of his master. Potiphar made Joseph overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that Potiphar put Joseph in charge, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not concern himself with anything except the bread which he ate. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. After some time, Potiphar's wife took notice of Joseph and asked him to lie with her. But Joseph refused, citing his master's trust in him and the wickedness of sinning against God. Despite her persistent attempts to seduce him, Joseph refused to listen to her, to lie with her, or to be with her. One day, Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside. Potiphar's wife caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But Joseph left his garment in her hand and fled outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled, she called to the men of her house, claiming that Joseph had tried to force himself on her, and she had cried out loudly, causing him to flee and leave his garment behind. She kept his garment by her until Potiphar came home and told him the same story. When Potiphar heard his wife's words and saw Joseph's garment, his anger was aroused, and he took Joseph and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, giving him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, and whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's hand, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife is a classic example of the consequences of integrity and the resilience of faith in the face of adversity. Despite being falsely accused and imprisoned, Joseph remains committed to his moral principles and his trust in God. The Lord's presence and favor in Joseph's life, even in the midst of hardship, foreshadows the greater purpose and plan that will unfold through his experiences. The story also highlights the importance of resisting temptation and the potential consequences of giving in to it. The Cupbearer and the Baker While Joseph was in prison, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned Joseph to attend to them, and they were in custody for some time. One night, both the cupbearer and the baker had dreams, each dream with its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he noticed their sadness and asked why they were so sad. They told him they had each had a dream, but there was no one to interpret them. Joseph replied that interpretations belong to God and asked them to tell him their dreams. The chief cupbearer told his dream first. In his dream, a vine was before him with three branches. As it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in his hand, and he took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, then placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph interpreted the dream, explaining that the three branches were three days. Within three days, Pharaoh would lift up the cupbearer's head and restore him to his position, and he would put Pharaoh's cup in his hand as before. Joseph asked the cupbearer to remember him when it was well with him, to show kindness to him, and to mention him to Pharaoh, to get him out of the prison, as he had been stolen away from the land of the Hebrews and had done nothing deserving of imprisonment. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he told Joseph his dream. 
He had three white baskets on his head, with all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh in the uppermost basket. But the birds ate them out of the basket on his head. Joseph interpreted the dream, saying that the three baskets were three days. Within three days, Pharaoh would lift off the baker's head and hang him on a tree, and the birds would eat his flesh. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. The story of the cupbearer and the baker demonstrates Joseph's gift for interpreting dreams, a skill that will later prove crucial in his rise to power in Egypt. It also showcases Joseph's compassion and concern for others as he seeks to help his fellow prisoners despite his own challenging circumstances. The contrast between the fates of the cupbearer and the baker highlights the accuracy of Joseph's interpretations and foreshadows his ability to discern the meaning of Pharaoh's dreams in the future. The cupbearer's forgetfulness, however, prolongs Joseph's stay in prison and serves as a reminder that God's timing and plan may not always align with human expectations. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Two years after the events with the cupbearer and the baker, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the river, and seven cows, fine-looking and fat, came up out of the river and fed in the meadow. Then, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. Pharaoh then awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time. In this dream, seven heads of grain, plump and good, came up on one stalk. After them, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up. The thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. Pharaoh awoke, and it was a dream. In the morning, Pharaoh's spirit was troubled, and he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them. Then the chief cupbearer remembered Joseph and told Pharaoh how Joseph had accurately interpreted his dream and the dream of the chief baker when they were in prison. Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. After shaving and changing his clothes, Joseph came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh told Joseph that he had heard of his ability to understand a dream and interpret it. Joseph humbly replied that it was not in him, but that God would give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Pharaoh then recounted his dreams to Joseph. Joseph interpreted the dreams, explaining that both dreams carried the same meaning. The seven good cows and the seven good heads of grain represented seven years of plenty, while the seven thin and ugly cows and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind represented seven years of famine that would follow. God had shown Pharaoh what he was about to do. There would be seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt, followed by seven years of famine, which would consume the land. Joseph advised Pharaoh to select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt to take up a fifth of the harvest during the seven plentiful years and store the grain for the coming years of famine. Pharaoh recognized that the Spirit of God was in Joseph and that there was none as discerning and wise as him. Pharaoh set Joseph over all the land of Egypt, making him second only to Pharaoh himself. He gave Joseph his signet ring, dressed him in fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck. Joseph was given the Egyptian name Zaphnath Paniah, and Pharaoh gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potipharo, priest of On, as his wife. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt, collecting and storing the excess grain during the seven years of plenty. The grain he stored was like the sand of the sea very much, until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. During this time, Asenath bore Joseph two sons. He named the firstborn Manasseh, saying, For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. The second son he named Ephraim, saying, For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. When the seven years of plenty ended and the seven years of famine began, the famine was in all lands. But in Egypt, there was bread. When the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, he told them to go to Joseph and do whatever he said. Joseph opened the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians as the famine became severe in the land. All countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. The story of Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dreams marks a turning point in his life and the history of his family. Through this event, 
God elevates Joseph from a position of imprisonment and obscurity to one of great authority and influence in Egypt. Joseph's wisdom, inspired by God, not only saves Egypt from the devastation of the famine, but also sets the stage for the eventual migration of his family to Egypt, where they will grow into a great nation. The naming of his sons reflects Joseph's perspective on his journey, acknowledging both the hardships he has faced and the blessings God has bestowed upon him. This story highlights the sovereignty of God in orchestrating events and using even difficult circumstances to accomplish His purposes and fulfill His promises. The Second Journey to Egypt As the famine continued to be severe in the land, Jacob and his family used up the grain they had brought from Egypt. Jacob instructed his sons to go back and buy a little more food. Judah reminded his father that the man in Egypt had solemnly warned them that they would not see his face unless their brother Benjamin was with them. If Jacob sent Benjamin, they would go down, but if he did not, they would not go. Israel asked why they had treated him so badly by telling the man they had another brother. The brothers explained that the man had asked directly about their family and whether their father was still alive. They had answered his questions honestly, not knowing he would demand to see their brother. Judah then said to Israel his father to send the boy with him, and they would go so that they might live and not die along with their children. Judah offered to be a surety for Benjamin, taking the blame forever if he did not bring him back. He pointed out that if they had not delayed, they could have gone and returned twice by now. Israel relented, telling them to take some of the best fruits of the land as a present for the man, along with double the money, to return the money that was put back in their sacks. He prayed that God Almighty would give them mercy before the man, that he might release Simeon and Benjamin. The brothers took the gifts, double the money and Benjamin, and went down to Egypt where they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he instructed his steward to take the men to his home, slaughter an animal, and prepare a meal, as they would dine with him at noon. The men were afraid, thinking they were being brought to Joseph's house because of the money that was returned in their sacks the first time. They approached the steward and explained the situation with the money, stating that they had brought it back, along with additional money to buy food. The steward reassured them, telling them not to be afraid, as their God and the God of their father had given them treasure in their sacks, and he had received their money. He then brought Simeon out to them. The men prepared their present for Joseph's arrival at noon and bowed down before him when he came. Joseph asked about their well-being and their father. They bowed their heads in humility and answered that their father was in good health. When Joseph saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he asked if this was their youngest brother. He said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and sought a place to weep. After washing his face, he composed himself and said, Serve the bread. The brothers were seated separately from the Egyptians, who found eating with Hebrews detestable. The brothers were seated in order of their birth, causing them to look at one another in astonishment. Portions were served to them from Joseph's table, with Benjamin's portion being five times as much as any of theirs. They drank and were merry with him. This second journey to Egypt marks a turning point in the reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers. The presence of Benjamin, Joseph's beloved younger brother, evokes strong emotions in him, and the seating arrangement according to birth order suggests a deeper knowledge of the brothers' identities. Despite the brothers' initial fear and concern about the returned money, Joseph's warm reception and generous hospitality begin to put them at ease. The stage is set for the final test of the brothers' character and the ultimate revelation of Joseph's true identity. Throughout the narrative, the themes of forgiveness, providence, and the fulfillment of God's plan continue to intertwine as the family is drawn closer to a dramatic reunion. Joseph's Cup in Benjamin's Sack After the meal, Joseph instructed his steward to fill the men's sacks with as much food as they could carry and to put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. He also told the steward to put his silver cup in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, along with his grain money. The steward did as Joseph had directed. In the morning, as soon as it was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city but were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward to pursue the men and, when he overtook them, to ask why they had repaid evil for good by stealing his silver cup. The steward overtook them and repeated these words. The brothers were shocked and protested their innocence, reminding the steward that they had even brought back the money they found in their sacks on the first journey. They declared that if any of them were found with the cup, he would die, and the rest would become Joseph's slaves. 
The steward agreed, but said that only the one who was found with the cup would be his slave, and the rest would be blameless. Each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and the steward searched, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. The cup was found in Benjamin's sack. The brothers tore their clothes, loaded their donkeys, and returned to the city. Joseph was still there when Judah and his brothers came in, and they fell before him on the ground. Joseph asked what they had done and if they did not know that a man like him could certainly practice divination. Judah asked what they could say to clear themselves, acknowledging that God had found out their iniquity and that they were all Joseph's slaves. Joseph replied that only the man in whose hand the cup was found would be his slave, and the rest could go in peace to their father. Judah approached Joseph and recounted how the Lord had asked about their father and younger brother, and how they had told him that their father loved the youngest, as his brother was dead. Judah reminded Joseph that he had told them to bring their youngest brother down, or they would not see his face again. He explained their father's reluctance to send Benjamin, fearing that harm might befall him, which would bring down his gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Judah then offered himself as a slave in Benjamin's place, as he had become surety for the boy to his father. He could not bear to see the evil that would come upon his father if Benjamin did not return. This dramatic turn of events, with Joseph's cup being found in Benjamin's sack, serves as the final test of the brothers' character and their loyalty to one another. Judah's heartfelt plea and offer to take Benjamin's place demonstrate a profound change in the brothers' attitudes and priorities. No longer are they willing to sacrifice one of their own for their own self-interest, as they had done with Joseph years earlier. Instead, they show a newfound sense of responsibility, empathy, and self-sacrifice. This transformation in the brothers' character sets the stage for Joseph's revelation of his true identity and the emotional reconciliation that follows. The story also highlights the theme of divine providence, as Joseph recognizes that God has orchestrated these events to bring about his purposes and to preserve the family. Joseph reveals his identity. Upon hearing Judah's impassioned plea, Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried out for everyone to leave him alone with his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? His brothers were so dismayed that they could not answer him. Joseph asked his brothers to come near to him, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph explained that the famine had been in the land for two years, and there were still five years in which there would be neither plowing nor harvesting. He emphasized that God had sent him ahead of them to preserve a posterity for them in the earth and to save their lives by a great deliverance. Joseph reassured his brothers that it was not they who had sent him to Egypt, but God, who had made him a father to Pharaoh, lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. He urged them to hurry back to their father and tell him of Joseph's glory in Egypt and to bring their father down to him quickly. Joseph then fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. When the report reached Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Pharaoh told Joseph to invite his father and his entire household to come to Egypt, where he would provide for them and give them the best of the land. Pharaoh also offered wagons to transport their wives, children, and belongings. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons, provisions for the journey, and changes of garments. To Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. To his father he sent ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father's journey. Joseph sent his brothers away with a final admonition not to become troubled along the way. They went up out of Egypt and came to Jacob in Canaan, telling him that Joseph was still alive and was governor over all the land of Egypt. Jacob's heart stood still, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the wagons Joseph had sent to carry him, Jacob's spirit revived. Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. This poignant scene of Joseph revealing his identity to his brothers marks the climax of the story and the resolution of the conflict that has driven the narrative. Joseph's emotional response and his brother's shock and dismay highlight the intensity of the moment and the depth of the pain and estrangement they have experienced. 
At the same time, Joseph's interpretation of the events as part of God's plan to preserve the family and fulfill his promises underscores the theme of divine providence that runs throughout the story. The brothers' stunned silence and Joseph's reassurance and generosity demonstrate the power of forgiveness and reconciliation. Pharaoh's favorable response and offer of support reflect the high esteem in which Joseph is held and the way in which his presence has brought blessing to Egypt. Finally, Jacob's reaction, initially one of disbelief and then of renewed spirit, sets the stage for the emotional reunion that will follow and the fulfillment of God's promise to make Israel a great nation, even in the midst of the challenges and setbacks they have faced. Jacob goes to Egypt. Upon hearing the news that Joseph was alive and the invitation to come to Egypt, Israel set out on his journey with all that he had. When he came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night, saying, Jacob, Jacob. Jacob replied, Here I am. God identified himself as the God of his father and told him not to fear going down to Egypt, for he would make him a great nation there. God promised to go with Jacob to Egypt and to bring him up again, assuring him that Joseph would put his hand on his eyes. Jacob and his family, including his sons, their wives, and their children, along with their livestock and goods, embarked on the journey to Egypt in the wagons Pharaoh had sent. The chapter then lists the names of the descendants of Israel who went to Egypt, totaling 70 persons, including Joseph and his sons who were already in Egypt. Jacob sent Judah ahead to Joseph to point the way to Goshen, where they would settle. Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household that he would go up and tell Pharaoh that his brothers and his father's household had come from the land of Canaan with their flocks, herds, and all that they owned. He instructed them, when Pharaoh called them and asked about their occupation, to say that they were men of livestock from their youth until now, so that they might dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd was an abomination to the Egyptians. Jacob's journey to Egypt marks a significant turning point in the history of the Israelites. It fulfills the prophecy given to Abraham that his descendants would be sojourners in a land not their own, and it sets the stage for the growth of the nation and the events of the Exodus that will follow. At the same time, Jacob's initial hesitation and the reassurance he receives from God highlight the challenges and uncertainties that come with such a major transition. Joseph's Leadership in the Famine Joseph went and told Pharaoh that his father, brothers, and their households had come from Canaan with their livestock and possessions and were now in Goshen. He presented five of his brothers to Pharaoh, who asked about their occupation. As instructed, they replied that they were shepherds and had come to dwell in the land because the famine was severe in Canaan. They requested to settle in Goshen, and Pharaoh granted their request, offering to put any capable men in charge of his own livestock. Joseph then brought his father Jacob before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. When asked his age, Jacob replied that he was 130 years old and that his years had been few and difficult, not attaining the years of his father's. Jacob blessed Pharaoh again and went out from his presence. Joseph settled his father and brothers in Egypt, giving them property in the best of the land, in Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. He provided his father, brothers, and all his father's household with bread, according to the number in their families. As the famine continued and the land of Egypt and Canaan languished, Joseph gathered up all the money in both lands in exchange for grain. When the money was exhausted, the Egyptians came to Joseph asking for bread, as they were ready to die. Joseph told them to bring their livestock in exchange for bread, and he provided them with bread in exchange for their horses, flocks, herds, and donkeys. The following year, the people came to Joseph saying they had nothing left but their bodies and lands. They proposed to become Pharaoh's servants and give their land to Pharaoh in exchange for seed, so they might live and not die. Thus, Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, as every Egyptian sold his field due to the severity of the famine. Joseph relocated the people into the cities and made them servants from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, as they had rations from Pharaoh. Joseph gave the people seed to sow, instituting a law that one-fifth of the produce belonged to Pharaoh, with four-fifths remaining as their own. The people acknowledged that Joseph had saved their lives and declared themselves Pharaoh's servants. Israel dwelt in Goshen, 
acquired possessions and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Jacob lived in Egypt for 17 years, and the length of his life was 147 years. As his death drew near, Jacob made Joseph swear to bury him with his fathers in Canaan. Joseph swore, and Israel bowed himself on the head of his bed. Jacob blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. Sometime later, Joseph was told that his father was sick. He took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to see Jacob. When Jacob was told that Joseph had come, he strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Jacob recounted to Joseph how God Almighty had appeared to him at Luz in Canaan, blessed him, and promised to make him fruitful, multiply him, make him an assembly of peoples, and give the land to his descendants as an everlasting possession. Jacob then declared that Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born in Egypt, would be his own, just as Reuben and Simeon were. Any children born to Joseph after them would be his own and named after their brothers in their inheritance. Jacob recalled Rachel's death and burial on the way to Ephrath. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he asked who they were. Joseph presented them to his father, who kissed and embraced them. Israel's eyes were dim with age, so Joseph brought them near to him. Israel said he never expected to see Joseph's face again, but God had also shown him Joseph's offspring. Joseph then bowed before his father, placing Ephraim on his right toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand. Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Israel blessed Joseph and his sons, invoking the God before whom his fathers Abraham and Isaac had walked, the God who had been his shepherd all his life, and the angel who had redeemed him from all evil. He prayed that his name and the name of his fathers would be named upon the lads, and that they would grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased and tried to move it to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father that Manasseh was the firstborn and should receive the right hand. But his father refused, saying he knew that Manasseh would also become a people and be great. But his younger brother would be greater than he, and his descendants would become a multitude of nations. Israel blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Israel then said to Joseph that he was dying, but God would be with him and bring him back to the land of his fathers. He gave Joseph one portion above his brothers, which he had taken from the hand of the Amorite with his sword and bow. This chapter highlights the importance of the birthright and the passing down of the covenant blessings from one generation to the next. Jacob's adoption of Ephraim and Manasseh as his own sons elevates Joseph's status and gives him a double portion of the inheritance. At the same time, Jacob's preferential treatment of Ephraim over Manasseh despite Joseph's objections, demonstrates the principle that God often works through the younger or less likely candidate to accomplish his purposes. The blessings pronounced by Jacob on Joseph's sons also foreshadow the future prominence of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh in the history of Israel. Jacob's Blessings on His Sons Jacob called his sons together to tell them what would befall them in the days to come. He addressed each son individually pronouncing blessings, prophecies, and in some cases, rebukes. To Reuben, his firstborn, he declared that he would not excel because he had defiled his father's bed. Simeon and Levi were rebuked for their anger and cruelty, and Jacob prophesied that they would be divided and scattered in Israel. Judah was praised and described as a lion's whelp, with the scepter and lawgiver not departing from him until Shiloh comes. Zebulun was foretold to dwell by the haven of the sea and become a haven for ships. Issachar was described as a strong donkey, bearing the burden of tribute. Dan was prophesied to judge his people as a serpent by the way and a viper by the path. Gad was said to be raided by a troop but would raid at their heels. Asher's bread would be rich, and he would yield royal dainties. Naphtali was described as a deer let loose, giving goodly words. Joseph was recognized as a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. Though archers bitterly attacked him, his bow remained in strength and his arms were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Blessings of heaven above, of the deep, and of the breasts and womb were invoked upon Joseph. Benjamin was described as a ravenous wolf, devouring prey in the morning and dividing spoil at night. Jacob declared these to be the twelve tribes of Israel and blessed them each according to their blessing. He then charged them to bury him with his fathers in the cave in the field of Machpelah, which Abraham had bought as a burial place. 
After commanding his sons, Jacob breathed his last and was gathered to his people. This chapter serves as a prophetic glimpse into the future of the twelve tribes of Israel, with each son's blessing and prophecy reflecting the characteristics and destiny of his descendants. Judah's blessing is particularly significant, as it establishes his tribe as the one through which the Messiah would come. Joseph's blessing is also noteworthy, as it highlights his role as a provider and protector for the family, and foreshadows the prominent role his descendants, particularly Ephraim, would play in the nation of Israel. The chapter also emphasizes the importance of passing on the faith and covenant promises to the next generation, as Jacob ensures that his sons will carry on the legacy of their forefathers. Death of Jacob and Joseph After Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. Joseph fell on his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. Then Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father, which took forty days. The Egyptians mourned for Jacob seventy days. After the days of mourning, Joseph spoke to the house of Pharaoh, asking for permission to go up and bury his father in the burial place he had prepared in Canaan, as Jacob had made him swear to do. Pharaoh granted permission, and Joseph went up to bury his father, accompanied by all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, the elders of the land of Egypt, all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their children, flocks, and herds remained in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went with Joseph, forming a very great gathering. They came to the threshing floor of Atad beyond the Jordan and lamented with a great and very solemn lamentation for seven days. The inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, remarked on the morning and named the place Abel Mizraim. Jacob's sons did for him as he had commanded them, burying him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, which Abraham had bought as a burial place. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him. Joseph's brothers, seeing that their father was dead, feared that Joseph would hate them and fully repay them for all the evil they had done to him. They sent a message to Joseph, claiming that before his death, their father had commanded them to ask for Joseph's forgiveness. The brothers also spoke to Joseph directly, offering to be his servants. Joseph wept when they spoke to him and reassured them, telling them not to be afraid. For though they had intended evil against him, God had meant it for good, to bring about the saving of many lives. He promised to provide for them and their children, comforting them and speaking kindly to them. Joseph and his father's house remained in Egypt, and Joseph lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, and the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, who were brought up on Joseph's knees. As he neared death, Joseph told his brothers that he was dying, but God would surely visit them and bring them out of Egypt to the land he had sworn to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying that when God visited them, they would carry his bones up from Egypt. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and they embalmed him and put him in a coffin in Egypt. The death of Jacob and Joseph marks the end of an era and the beginning of a new chapter in the story of the Israelites. Jacob's elaborate burial procession and the mourning of the Egyptians demonstrate the respect and influence he had gained, while also fulfilling his desire to be buried in the promised land with his ancestors. Joseph's final words to his brothers offer comfort, forgiveness, and a reminder of God's overarching plan and faithfulness. His request to have his bones carried back to Canaan when God visits his people shows his faith in the promise and his identification with his true homeland. The stage is set for the next generation of Israelites to grow and multiply in Egypt until the time comes for God to deliver them and lead them to the land he has promised.